Time to get inside. I'm sorry I used your dog. Okay. Who are you? Is this... Is this 212? No, this is 123. That's, that's a very easy mistake to make. I, uh... What do you want from me? I, I'm looking for people who murdered my wife. They're not and or loved ones. They're not here. Wait, how old are you now? I, I'm old enough. I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at a regular normal age. Are you dripping? I hope, I hope not. I hope we applied it real good. What do you want from me? I guess nothing. You ever murdered anybody? What? No! Let's keep it that way. Well, my work here is done. <laughs> oh, this is bad. This feels bad. Why does it all feel bad? Oh, God. Oh, no! Oh, God, no. Oh, I think I can feel my coccyx. It's in my spine. My coccyx is in my spine. Oh no! Oh, it's getting... it's getting so dark! It's so dark! Oh, I'm John Ross. Death Wish is a movie from 2018 directed by Eli Roth and starring Bruce Willis. And Bruce Willis does this at the end of the movie. Hey! What a wacky little moment from regular good guy Bruce Willis. Good, good, good old action guy, big action star, still in 2018. Anyway, look, I really hated watching Death Wish 2018. It's, it's such a odd and dull movie. It also has a lot of weird messages about vigilantism and a, and a fairly clear conservative gun control message to go along with it that would make any Republican come so hard that you could see his stains from space. I don't shoot to kill, I shoot to stay alive. Law-abiding criminals don't exist. When seconds count, cops are minutes away. But I really wanted to know why this movie existed. I mean, other than her, okay. For that review, I decided to look at the history of the film series Death Wish and why it became so popular, why people love them so much, and what they have to say about the American mindset towards vigilantism. For those who don't know, Death Wish was originally a film from 1974 and has a huge cult fan base. There are literally dozens of Death Wish only Facebook groups and pages. And they are usually, you know, full of boomers, but there are also a few young people who grew up watching the films with their parents or completely unsupervised that's completely up to them. But anyway, look, it's an odd film series and I really, really wanted to talk about it. I only have a slight connection to the films as I had friends who really, really loved the films and we, we loved watching them on like a Saturday afternoon or a, or a Friday night, getting movies from, you know, video stores and just kind of chilling out and enjoying how horrible they truly were. All right, all right. It's your night. And look, there are some young film fans who still love this film. They're, they're all very, very adamant about sharing compilations or the odd moments from Death Wish 2 and 3. And who couldn't love a film series where Jeff Goldblum is in it for about five minutes and then does this? Fucking hell. Anyway, let's look at what is a Death Wish. Death Wish was originally a series that spanned from 1974 to 1994 and starred this man, Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson played a man throughout the entire series called Paul Kersey. He, he looks like he's, you know, always staring at the sun and waving a gun at said sun. Each movie, the storyline revolves around something awful happening to Kersey and, you know, then in return, Paul goes on a murderous rampage, gunning down dozens of people at a time. It's not a great message. It's not nuanced. It's not intentionally exposed to, you know, ideas that would say, hey, maybe there are better ideas than just killing people. Mm. I bet muggings are down, they're afraid to tell us. There's only one way to find out. Take a walk on Columbus Avenue tonight. For this video essay alone, I'm going to break down all the Death Wish movies, the context they existed in, the filmmaking, and ultimately, how they were poorly adapted twice 
from novels. So if you want to skip to that, here's the time code for wanting to talk about the different Death Wish movies. For example, if you've already seen and know how you feel about the first Death Wish film, that's fine, you can watch this part. But if you wanted to go through all of the other films, well, there are the time codes for that. They're also in the description as well. But the main reason I'm doing this is definitely not because things are very, very bad right now, and these films are super relevant in 2020. Look, all of these films are on Laserdisc. Look at them all. Look at all these, la la all five of them. Laserdiscs are everywhere now. Yeah. First, we have to talk about the original movie, since Death Wish 2018 is a remake of a film from 1974, which itself was based on a book from 1972 by this man, Brian Garfield. And you bet your dick there's going to be a lot of pictures and footage of Garfield in this video essay. To start with, Brian and his bookie Wook Garfield was originally a western novelist, writing under the pen names Frank and Brian Wynn. But in the early 70s he began writing crime novels using his actual name, predating Garfield in print by over a decade. In 1971 he began to write Death Wish, a novel about an accountant in New York called Paul Benjamin, who turns to vigilanteism after his wife is killed and his daughter is put into a vegetative state after a mugging. In 1972 the book was published, but was not a bestseller on release. It sold only a couple thousand copies and then was eventually bought up by Paramount Pictures. It would only become a bestseller once the movie was released in 1974, and since 1974, there have been over 20 million copies sold around the world. I started to read the book on archive.org, but then it completely disappeared because Chuck Wendig got mad and told me I shouldn't be allowed to borrow books. Chuck, you're a fucking piece of shit loser, and I'm glad you blocked me for whatever reason. But within the first few chapters I read of Death Wish, I got a weird sense that the book was more about the fear of change and urban sprawl rather than vigilantism. In fact, the main character, Paul Benjamin, not Paul Kersey, doesn't even kill anyone until the last few chapters of the novel. In fact, it's it's at page 170 out of a 220 page novel. All I'm saying is that if you have a book with death in the title and someone doesn't kill someone until 75% way through the novel, I'd be pretty pissed because that's blatant false advertising guff. The book is quite a slow burn. But to be honest, to get to the inciting incident of the novel, which unfortunately is the rape and murder of the wife and daughter of Paul Benjamin, the first few chapters include just this really weird series of rants that are about corporate rule and excess and the distrust of technology and corruption and like why computers are bad and like just general hate of like urban decay and like the architecture in New York. This is part about the IRS tax code, but, but more importantly, the book itself isn't a gruesome mess. It's actually a real deep dive into the psyche of a man who has to deal with just terrible change in his life and then just kind of gets mad at the city because of how terrible it is. It's similar to that of like the parable of Job from the Bible, but if Job went to Jerusalem for the weekend to buy a Saturday night special and then killed a whole bunch of people, the story is more akin to a character study come Descent into Madness rather than a simple justified story much as the film is, which obviously I will get into. There's this gun-toting lone wolf narrative that's in there eventually in the last few chapters, but Brian Garfield actually spoke about the book and you know how he felt about it, especially in its adaptation, much later in his life. He was very, very upset about the adaptation, but even less upset of the incident that actually inspired him to write the book. And this is 100% true. The spark for the book, or at least parts of it, were inspired by an experience he had working in New York City. One night while visiting his publisher, Brian Garfield went to check on his car, a convertible, and found that the top of it had been slashed to ribbons. And that was it. That, that was it. Somebody had gone in and just cut up the top of his convertible and he was real upset. He got so mad about it because he had to drive home in the snow and he was just like, oh, I feel so mad that I could kill somebody. And that's it. That That's what Death Wish is essentially based on. The feelings and the wanting of justice for a ruined convertible. It's like if you wrote a whole novel about this sequence from Street Fighter 2. But seriously, Garfield was so upset and angry upon seeing this and then it began to slowly snow. He got more and more furious on his drive home along the Delaware River. It's about a three hour drive from the publisher penthouse to where he lived. And because the ruined top didn't help cover the snow, Garfield was so upset because he was just a little bit too cold and he thought to himself, and this is an actual quote, I'll kill the son of a bitch who did this. Good thing, you know, he wrote that book and Hollywood really loves taking that feeling and putting it into a book and then having these nuanced characters and trying to figure out their place in the world and those characters, how they do, no, they didn't. They they just they just made this. This is the movie they made. Hey. Fill your hand.
mind. Now, for this video, I say I watched every Death Wish movie because I felt that I had to. For this review, I was trying to get a sense of context and understanding on of why the 2018 version of Death Wish exists, but also what these films kind of had in relation to that film. I actually looked into the history of Charles Bronson. He was a kid who grew up in a coal mining town. He was actually an actor for about 20 years before he even accepted the role in Death Wish. Bronson was actually working on the detective thriller The Stone Killer with the director of Death Wish, Michael Winner. They were discussing future projects together and Bronson was asking what he was working on next. When asked, Michael Winner showed him the Death Wish script. Winner replied, this is the best script I've got. Bronson asked what it was about and <laughs> Winner said it's about a man whose wife and daughter are mugged and he goes out and shoots muggers. I'd like to do that, Bronson said. The film asked Winner. Bronson replied, no, shoot muggers. You can't hit me! I'll have you up on charges. Who hit you? I wouldn't do a thing like that. <laughs> So, eventually Bronson accepted the role and they made the film. So you know everyone was definitely in the right mindset to make this film after that quote. And that's what he did. As in he, he no, he appeared in the movie. He didn't actually kill- There's a lot I'll go into about Bronson and who he was in Hollywood, but also you have to remember that this guy was a huge international star by this point. He was an internationally renowned actor in so many different places including Germany, France, Japan, Yugoslavia. He was known as the biggest action star not in the United States. But after watching the film, I have to say that I was told that the films get worse over time. Death Wish itself isn't a great film. Yes, it's an exploitation film, and yes, it is a piece of culture of its time. But Death Wish ultimately is a weird film. It has a very straightforward story. Architect Paul Kersey, yes, they changed that and his name, he becomes a vigilante after his wife and daughter are brutally raped and murdered. After seeking help from the cops, Kersey decides to take matters into his own hands after an Arizona property mogul gives him a gun as a present. And when he sees this like Western showcase thingy, I don't know, is that even a thing anymore? Like, can you go? I mean, I guess not in during COVID, but like, I, I don't know, maybe this is just a 70s thing. And then after he returns back to New York City, things kind of just spiral out from there. The weird thing about the movie and the kind of the main crux that I have to feel about the series in general is that the Death Wish films are a bit of a roller coaster. There are some good things about them. I don't think that the script is great. I don't think the directing is good, but there are good pieces of cinematography and especially for the first film, the score is quite good. And it's done by the amazing and accomplished and award-winning jazz composition creator, Herbie Hancock. And it, it's, it's so weird, and I will go get into this as well, but Herbie Hancock literally received a Grammy nomination for the score of this film. That's how good this fucking score is. And it's actually something I wouldn't be embarrassed to have in my own record collection. But I have to say, people who say that the first Death Wish film is the good one or a real movie, I beg to differ completely. The movie is not a great movie. It's well put together and has some great performances by Bronson and Stuart Marglin, who plays the Arizona property mogul, whose name I can't remember, but I'll put the name right here. Everything he does, everything he does is so spectacular and so fun and so enjoyable to watch. It feels like they transported him from a carry-on film into the Death Wish series. He feels so out of place that I kind of don't feel this kind of joy or at least enjoyment of these characters until probably Death Wish 3 or 4, which is at this moment in time a long way away somebody once said i forget who that he never looked back because something might be gaining on him what's gaining on you paul Everything else about the film is relatively awful, like I said before, excluding the cinematography and the score. Right off the bat, I have to say, Winner is a terrible director. He is definitely a hack. He does barely anything with the camera, and the editing is so awful at times, I do feel like he didn't know how to shoot an action film, despite having a long history of shooting action films. There's especially this scene here where there's a montage of Kersey helping out the property mogul survey and plan out the land, and it's nice. It gets things rolling. It shows that Bronson actually might be a character who is, you know, moving on with his life, getting things done, getting things in position to, you know, live a better life. But it also is just a weird scene where it looks like Charles Bronson knows how to survey a land for a property mogul. Like, you could put this in the realty ad, and I would believe that this is just how they survey land. Boy, howdy, you city slickers, you trying to figure out a way to make sure your life's a little bit better? Come on down to Arizona Realty. We're coming down here, make sure you got everything you need. I might sound a little bit from the south, 
but it doesn't matter, because I'm in here in Tucson, Arizona. We got a fantastic man, Paul Kersey, who's doing all the surveying now. Here's some footage of him. And it'd be very good if you all came down here, F figuring out where you gonna live with Ari Ari Arizona. It was called Arizona Realty. I've already <laughs> forgot what it was called. Fuck. As for directing actors, Winner only wants either excessive over-the-top performances from his actors, especially the rapists and muggers in the film, or stone-cold focused archetypes. They never really provide any nuance or give the characters any depth. I could tell you three things about the wife and mother, and Kersey for that matter, before all things go to shit. Also, there's this weird thing where the 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 son-in-law, the, the husband of his daughter, keeps calling him dad, and is that is that a thing? Like, I've never been married, but is that a thing? Is that a thing from the 70s? Come on, Dad, don't do a number. Hello, Jake. Dad. Dad, we got trouble. Look, I think that Winner and the characters here are just existent to either push the story forward to get to a point or to have an agenda to get to a point. And that's basically it. And despite the 95 minute runtime, the film really peaks shortly after the first murder and then it's just bloodshed after bloodshed after bloodshed with no real resolution. And then the film actually ends with a cop confronting Kersey in the hospital and telling him to leave the city. And I just, it, it feels... It feels so weird because Wendell Mays, who wrote the script, he's he's a good screenwriter. But I know that there are certain people, and especially in the book Bronson's Loose, they talk about that Winner was notorious for rewriting scripts, especially the Death Wish scripts. There are some scenes that are clearly trying to provide commentary on the media or public services in general, like this. I'll tell you one thing, the guy's a racist. You notice he kills more blacks than whites. Oh, for Pete's sake, Gary, more blacks are muggers than whites. What do you want us to do? Increase the proportion of white muggers who will have racial equality among muggers? And it's weird to hear them parroted now, almost 50 years after this film was made. But ultimately, they are just straw man arguments and they completely fall flat and have nothing to say. There is no real balance for any political side except for this very gun heavy, controversial statement here. Can you moan a handgun in New York City? Out here, I hardly know a man that doesn't own one. And I'll tell you something unlike your city, we can walk our streets and through our parks at night and feel safe. And I think it was controversial back then, but it's even more controversial now just to see the, the kind of political discussions that we kind of have. What about the old American social custom of self-defense? If the police don't defend us, maybe we ought to do it ourselves. We're not pioneers anymore, Dad. But eventually, look, besides all of that commentary and all of that discussion that the film tries to provide but really doesn't, the movie just kind of fizzles out in the final act. It makes me feel as though people saw what they wanted to see out of this movie. Now to try and justify this and try not to have my own personal biases, I try to do a lot of history about the responses to the film at the time as well as the critical responses. While it largely has a strong message that there should be more done with community outreach services, better training for cops, improvement in our healthcare system, and ways to improve mental healthcare, especially for those who were sexually assaulted. A lot of it is completely brushed over by male characters who simply don't have the time to explain or even go into any detail about what is happening. I, uh, I did today, a, a psychiatrist. He, uh, seems to feel it might help her if I took her away to another environment, uh, out of New York, on the shore, someplace. Sounds like a good idea. In fact, in the portions of the film that feature the daughter, she barely has any lines after the first 10 minutes of the film. And then apparently she goes from mental hospital to mental hospital until she ends up in a nunnery. Like, it's it's so weird. Like, the weirdest part of it all is that they try to set up Paul as this bleeding heart liberal, literally with these lines and these parts at the start of the film. You know, decent people are gonna have to work here and live somewhere else. By decent people, you mean people who can afford to live somewhere else. Oh, Christ. You are such a bleeding heart liberal, Paul. <laughs> You're probably one of them knee-jerk liberals thinks us gun boys will shoot our guns because it's a, an extension of our penises. I never thought about it that way. This is in the book. This is from the book. And despite him only saying these few lines, they really don't show him any possible light, anything that's really liberal or compassionate or anything that kind of shows him other than a little bit of like an urban elite. Like he lives in a nice apartment and he has all of this stuff. And that's one of the reasons why the muggers attack the family. I mean, it's, it just, it feels, it feels weird. And then, and, and to, to put all of this in perspective as well, there is a sequence in the film that 
I alluded to before, where Paul is being shown around to Son, Arizona. And it's by this guy, the, the property mogul. And there is this Western showcase thing, and it's cowboys all talking like this. Somebody stole my horse. And then shortly afterwards, Kirsty goes to a gun range to celebrate a job well done with the mogul. He talks about how his dad was a hunter and was killed because his mate thought he was a deer or some shit, like some real, some real Dick Cheney shit. You see, my father was a hunter. I guess out here you call him a gunman. My mother was the other side of the coin. When my father was killed in a hunting accident, some fool mistook him for a deer, you see. And this whole sequence stands out because it's not like any of the other films. It's almost like a second crew shot it or a different director shot it. It's good. It's well shot and well edited. And the scene breathes a little into the observation of what I think the film is trying to get to, that dealing with this urban decay is very similar to the Old West. There's not a lot of people who are able to solve these problems and it is unable to be tamed or civilized in a real fucked up kind of way. A good writer or director would be able to piece together a very good metaphor here about how the concept of American mythology and masculinity is built around an ideal that never truly existed. That they are literally just plain cowboys. For those who build this up and try to push that legacy and that ideology, they end up damaging the psychology of themselves and those around them. That is a part of what the book is trying to talk about. But now fuck all that! It's just about cowboys! About the, ah! Ah! The the city's like the West! Whoopee! Yeah! Pew pew pew! And it's, I, it's, there is no nuance. There, it's mainly just what I kind of said, which is like a Michael Bay version of America. It's so he can say these two lines at the end of the movie to make him seem more badass. Draw. And it's kind of sad. Like, yes, there's a bit of a setup and payoff, and it was probably planned that way. It feels like the last words of a man dying from brain worms and a gunshot wound. It doesn't feel like it's actually saying anything. Ultimately, while there are repercussions for Kersey's actions, there is no legal repercussions. Obviously, he gets shot, he's injured, but he lives. He goes to Chicago at the end of the movie, and the film feels like it's a character study about a broken man who has awful things before him, and then as a retribution does awful things to awful people. Nobody wins. Nobody's a hero, but obviously Bronson is praised as such because of the violence he decks out. The movie ends like this. And I tried to look into the history of the film. I, I, I read a lot of Bronson's Loose by Paul Talbot, and while a lot of that book is praising a lot of the people who were a part of the film, I don't think it was a really balanced look. I do, I do get that Paul Talbot is a huge fan of these films, and he got some very, very unique interviews, and I appreciate that overall. The thing about the film is that it's very divisive when it came out, and obviously people can look at it from a modern perspective and look at the Rotten Tomato score or the Metacritic or even just look at the Wikipedia page, but I do have to say there is a lot of nuance that I think Talbot's book actually provides on the historical response. The weirdest response, and I won't go into all of them, but the weirdest one that I found was the film was being talked about by the US Catholic Church's Division for Film and Broadcasting. I didn't know this existed. They openly hated the film and said that the movie appeals to an audience which thinks there would be an easy, violent answer to complex social problems. I didn't expect to agree with the US Catholic Church's Division for Film and Broadcasting, but I think that's the main message that the film is trying to convey and I don't think people got. It's one of the very few reviews that actually looks at the complex social issues and talks about them, including one from Roger Ebert, who actually got to interview Bronson before the movie came out, and I will get into that later on. Roger Ebert claimed the movie was a propaganda to private gun ownership and a call to vigilante justice. One of the most celebrated critics in film history believed that Death Wish was a call to get people to do the same. Now, to be fair to Michael Winner, I don't think a better fantasy is wrong. I don't think violence in film is wrong. I don't think any kind of depiction of terrible things in film is wrong. We have genocide, we have terrible things that happen in film that honestly we wouldn't do in our real lives. They are often based somewhat on real stories and they are done by actors who are trying their best to recreate that emotion or filmmakers who are trying to deliver a message about that. And I don't think everyone who saw Death Wish or films like it were going to become vigilantes. But I do have to say to exploit a nation's fear 
intentionally. And I think Bronson summed it up very, very well in the way that they were making the film. When asked about playing Kersey, he did state, I'm not in the movies for social reform. I'm in films for the money. That being said, before the film was released, Bronson was doing a series of press junkets for exhibitors for the film. They're people who are obviously going to be excited to put Death Wish in their cinemas. When a reporter asked him if he were prepared to play Kersey in any special way, Bronson replied with, no, because to play him, I draw upon my own feelings. I do believe I could perform this way myself. Yikes. Now look, the film would be so much better with a bit more nuance and balance. In fact, it would be a sad film if it wasn't for the fact that the murdering of the movie is almost always justified. And it even helps Bronson come out of a slump, like to the point where he repaints his whole apartment and listens to like funky music and then starts going to more parties and starts talking to more people. I, I... Hey, Jack. Turn it back up, I can't hear. I guess that's the true American dream. Kill people you don't like and have awful fucking orange walls. I think maybe that's that's the that's the hidden message of this film. But seriously, after watching the first film and how awful I feel about it, I wouldn't obviously be talking about this film for 20 minutes without wanting to at least have the question answered. Why did this film make so much fucking money? This much money? and then spawn four sequels, and then a reboot. When the film was released in 1974, the critics had a mixed response which commented on the excessive rape and violence in the film. Something that was kind of unintended by the original author, but definitely intended by Winner. The film currently has a 64% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and for those curious how the book differs from the movie, it does close with the main character going after a group of thieves, three guys and a girl, and he even shoots a few of them, including one man just below the eye while running down a fire escape. Kind of similar to how the movie ends, but this part is the most important. He's then confronted by a cop as he escapes this death encounter. He's injured and the cop just takes off his cap and then turns his back on Paul Benjamin. And then Paulie B literally just walks away, catches a cab home. That's it. That's how the novel ends. Like nothing gained, nothing learned from the experience. Garfield's novel closes on a great piece of like visual metaphor that shows authority literally turning its back on lawlessness. It's a little bit ham-fisted, but it still makes its point known. It's a gruesome visage of a man who went from a mild-mannered accountant to a broken vigilante in just a matter of weeks. It's a sobering and somber look at a man who goes out of his way to kill for the sake of killing. In the sequel to Death Wish, written by Garfield as well called Death Sentence, it's stated that Paul killed 17 people over the span of five weeks. But no one cares about that. Let's talk more about the movies and how people love them for how violent and fucked up they are. The New York Times critic Vincent Canby stated in 1974 that Death Wish is on its way to becoming one of the biggest dumb hits of the summer season, which is depressing news not terribly hard to understand. Canby adds, Paul Kersey describes his actions in the film as the good old American custom of self-defense. And then in brackets writes, as once practiced against the Indians? He continues, in other words, there's nothing wrong with this country today that giving guns to all the right people wouldn't cure. Who are the right people? White middle class maniacs. For anyone with two brain cells to rub together, that might be a tough question, but not for Death Wish. When talking about the messages for the film, Fernando F. Croser of Cinepassion unfortunately says, Michael Winner, a substantially less erudite Englishman, is doing the analysis here. Vigilantism as grief therapy? Despite some mild nausea following his first murder, Bronson becomes quite a gay desperado. Imagine that Dirty Harry actually existed, and you have this Nixonite gorge riser. I didn't know what the fuck a Nixonite gorge riser was. I had to look it up. It's literally just someone who is sickened by one's actions. It's actually taken from Hamlet. I don't know. I didn't study Shakespeare. It's such a weird look into the window of critics at this time that are trying to actually be a lot more critical about these types of films. Going back to Garfield, it, before his death in 2019, he had been outwardly against both adaptations and the franchise that blossomed these films. When discussing the original 1974 film, he stated that the movie had an enormous impact on people, but describing the filmmaking and its place in cinema history as woeful. Woeful as it may be, the first Death Wish grossed $20 million on a $3 million budget. This was a huge win for Paramount Pictures. At the time, they had just come off an amazing series of Academy Award winners, including the Godfather, and the highly successful and critically acclaimed films such as Serpico, Don't Look Now, The Great Gatsby, Chinatown, The Parallax View, The Conversation, stunning films made by auteurs that all were released in the same nine month window. They were on a roll and Paramount didn't see that they were going to stop it anytime soon. The film was an instant hit, but we also have to take into account it was opening up against such classics as Disney's Castaway Cowboy, Macon County Line, White Dawn, The Disney's Bear and I, The Barbara Streisand Vehicle for Pete's Sake, Golden Needle, 
needles. Jesus Christ. What the? What is golden needles? A legendary statue has seven golden needles inserted into it, and an adult man will become a sexual superman when the needles are placed in the same position of his body. A colorful group of characters is all in the hunt for this mysterious. Jesus Christ, 1974. To an ancient legend, the human body has seven forbidden acupuncture points. If stimulated correctly with a special golden needle, the result is everlasting youth. What, what else were you making that were- Oh, hey, there's Charles Bronson in Mr. Majestic. Okay, what the- f This is crazy. Because how- You're probably thinking to yourself, how is this 52-year-old man an action star? He was truly the Liam Neeson of his time. But that's for a different video I'm working on, and that's, that's why this video took so long. Anyway, look, we are looking at why people were super into this movie. And to answer that question, there's a few reasons why. Some of it's speculation, some of it historical facts, some of it film history, but a lot of it is definitely a bit bullshit and definitely quite scary and- has a few comparisons to what's going in America right now. So let's look at a little bit of American history before we get into Death Wish 2. But let's start with 1973. So 1973, the Watergate scandal kicks off. Spiro Agnew, the vice president, resigns due to tax evasion. An oil crisis affecting America so bad that the Nixon government, during their own scandal, are thinking of using military action to forcibly seize Middle Eastern oil fields in late 1973. Also, being gay is finally removed from the DSM-2. Then, we move into 1974. Patty Hearst is kidnapped in February and then robs banks with the Symbionese Liberation Army. A man named Samuel Bick attempts to hijack a plane and then crash into the White House to kill President Nixon. He's unsuccessful. In April, Carrie, a novel by former cokehead Stephen King, is released. In May, impeachment proceedings begin against Nixon. And in June, the UPC is invented. And none of this really has anything to do with Death Wish, but it's kind of good to know that technology and a lot of weird stuff was happening in America at the exact same time. ...to donate to school lunch programs throughout the country. The menu includes dishes like cheeseburgers, barbecued beef, chicken pie, crunchy peanut butter, and missiles. <laughs> that was the wrong film. Essentially, there was an air of confusion and uncertainty and corruption and concern that was rising in the early 1970s. It was mainly due to just a lot of unchecked conservative policies and a lack of resources to the lower and middle class of America. This is when a lot of that sort of erosion was sort of happening to those different classes. The summer of free love was well and truly over and people were scared to death of being in America. According to the US Bureau of Statistics, Public fear of crime was at 62% of Gallup poll respondents in 1970. And they felt that there was more crime in their neighborhood than literally one year prior. It was actually impossible for that to be the case. But meanwhile, in cinema, there was a huge shift happening in Hollywood thanks to these two movies in 1967 and Erectile dysfunction causes explosions the movie and drugs are pretty cool and we should ride motorcycles were huge hits in the US. There were independent films done by new directors and Hollywood was finally taking notice of them and accepting that this might be the new way forward for cinema to get people away from the big big problem they were having with television. Well, there were a few other films, there's obviously a lot in film history to take into account, but these two were very huge shifts in the way that people saw cinema and saw it evolve. There was a new crop of filmmakers that had just finished creating what was known as the American New Wave. They, these were films in Hollywood that were taking more realistic cinematic techniques, gritty, violent, and just unafraid to talk about real topics that Americans wanted to hear about but weren't necessarily talking about. They were borrowing from the likes of the French New Wave, and this is Jean-Luc Godard and Alain René. And uh, look, just within a few years prior to Death Wish, studios finally perked up and they found that there was ability to take less risks in violent cinema and talking about sex and talking about drugs than it was in making epics and musicals that cost about 25 to 50 million dollars. For example, Warner Brothers had just finished producing the Dirty Harry series. The sequel, Magnum Force, had just made 40 million dollars in 1973. On top of all of this, Hollywood was figuring out how to market these films, especially these exploitation films that were being made for less than a million dollars. This is about a movie about a couple of killers. Harry Callahan. And a homicidal maniac. 
including stuff you couldn't show on TV or even talk about in the mainstream media, and this was like X-rated nudity and plot lines that didn't conform to your ridiculous Hollywood structure. Enjoy this bush, and then see this random shot of an onion being cut off. Go, go fuck yourself, you go, some, go watch this art. Well, all of that is happening in Los Angeles, about 2,800 miles away in New York City. Abraham Beam is slowly being sworn in as the 104th mayor of New York City, following the terrible work of the previous mayor, John Lindsay. Now, originally, let's talk about John Lindsay for a sec. I swear to God, we'll get back to Death Wish. I'm not even kidding. You have to be a little bit nuts. It's not in the job description, but it helps. Lindsay was a Republican who switched to being a Democrat after he tried a presidential run. During a Gallup poll in 1972, Lindsay was one of the most hated mayors in New York City. 60% of New Yorkers felt that Lindsay's administration was so poor that only about 9%, less than a million people, rated it good. However, Gallup literally couldn't find one person in all of New York City to rate his current mayoral progress as excellent. A conservative historian, Fred Siegel, would later label Lindsay as the worst mayor New York City had in the 20th century. A man who gave Rudy Giuliani, now a crackpot, a real run for his fucking money, especially what's happening right now. Siegel was mainly mad at Lindsay because he lost 700,000 jobs and called him actively destructive during his seven years as mayor. The main point is that regardless, Lindsay couldn't do much with New York City and he eventually fell to the wayside in history. A lot of people in New York City saw this film and they were just simply sick of the corruption within the city and with America in general. Fear of crime was going up and the film confirmed their fears and biases. It wasn't confronting them or challenging them, just providing a solution as horrible as it was. Even just if it was simple as the national government trying to do their fucking job after five years of an awful response to Vietnam, with no plan to care for those returning from the failed war effort, and an energy crisis so bad that the United States started daylight savings seven months early. That's true. That's 100% true. Americans really just wanted bloodshed and probably oil, but mainly the bloodshed. They didn't really understand the oil thing. So after all of that, I decided to also look into a bit of you know, the history of Death Wish. In the book Bronson's Loose, a book about the legacy and making of the Death Wish movies, Paul Talbot talks to Bobby Roberts, a producer on the first Death Wish film, and he recounts the first screening they had in New York City. There was an amazing reaction. They got up and cheered at the first shooting. That's when we knew we had a hit. It was a movie that said a lot at the time. Did it, Bobby? Did, did it say a lot at the time? Or did people just really like seeing muggers being shot and there wasn't really going a lot in cinema at the time in 1974? Or maybe there was like a reality that no one wanted to see the swinging cheerleaders or figure out whatever the fuck Tamarind's seed was. They wanted Death Wish, because Death Wish made sense. Death Wish was a two word slogan that people could understand. Death Wish had such a cultural impact that was so big it has permeated almost all of pop culture. From The Simpsons, Tonight, we review an aging Charles Bronson in Death Wish 9. I wish I was dead. To even Bronson's cursey showing up in a fucking Spider-Man comic. Look at this, look at this shit. And look at the headline. Look, 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 look at this. Look at all this. Vigilante strikes again. I, I, Paul Cursey technically exists in the MCU at some point. Back to the film and its response. Upon its release, the movie was a hit. Within literally five days, the film was bringing in so much money, Paramount raised the ticket prices from $3.50 to $4. Now that might not sound that much. That's 50 cents different. That's, you know, like a uh, cone from McDonald's. This is the modern equivalent of a cinema raising the ticket prices from $18 to $25 because Disney didn't think that they were making enough money off Avengers Endgame. The only other times, and this is 100% true, the only other times Paramount had done this prior was The Godfather and The Great Gatsby. That's how big Death Wish was to Paramount. So basically they just gouged the shit out of an audience that was really hungry for these types of films. It was really a right place, right time, right audience kind of thing. The movie was marketed extremely well and it didn't have a lot of competition and it was talking and tapping into a zeitgeist that Americans were currently feeling. People felt uneasy about the rising tide of violence in the media and they were talking about it and rather than helping fund necessary services and actually having discussions, 95 minutes for $4 in 1974 was a really, 
really good way to ease your stresses about the modern world. It was either that or like listen to Brian Eno or have a fucking fondue party and no one really wants to do either of those things. Not then, not now, not ever. From the initial responses from the theatres, according to Talbot's book, Paramount spent a million dollars, which was a huge amount in those days, on promotion. They released a press book that bragged about theatres holding special screenings for auxiliary police forces, which are basically just volunteer cops who don't get paid, which I don't know why they exist. People always have complaints about um, their communities and the safety. Become part of something greater and become an auxiliary police officer to give back to your community and help keep your community safe. And also was shown to communities to prevent a mugging. Also in 1974, New York Times journalist Judy Klemsrud even wrote a piece researching how New Yorkers actually felt about the film. The range of responses, which I won't include here, but a lot of them were between how people felt that the film wasn't racist at all, to that it was the worst film that they had ever seen in their life and was so racist that they would never watch it again. Klemsrud's piece also included words from the producer Dino De Laurentiis, who explicitly stated that the film was not an invitation to take to the streets with a gun. And he Here's the kicker that De Laurentiis said, it is an invitation to the authorities to come up with remedies to the problems of urban violence and fast. Something I didn't expect to read from the producers of this film. A year later in 1975, when it was doing press for the movie in the United Kingdom, it stated that the film was applauded all over the world, including in his hometown of London. One quote from Winner saying that, oh boy, this is rough. They want to keep these people out, let Charles Bronson deal with them in America, and stop them from coming here. That's gonna be a fucking yikes for me, holy shit. In a much more tragic series of events, Brian Garfield also talked about what happened when CBS, a TV network in the United States, decided to air the film in the early 1980s. It was tragic because Garfield himself felt responsible for the amount of copycats that would actually go on to do vigilante justice that was 100% unjustified in certain places. One story that Garfield recounts is about an African-American man who was in Redondo Beach, California. The man was carrying a TV which the locals assumed he had stolen. It wasn't. He owned it and was taking it to be repaired but was killed anyway. When the killers were questioned, they said that they got the idea from the movie Death Wish and that it had been shown a few weeks prior. While reading the book Bronson's Loose, Bobby Roberts' son, Todd Roberts, talks about how not all Death Wish fans are vigilantes, which is definitely the case. However, Todd states that cops really love the film, even though, as Todd points out, Cops are the bad guys in the movie. While I was trying to condense a lot of history and reactions to Death Wish, I can tell you now that I think that ultimately people enjoyed the film for its cathartic nature, even if it was speaking to a darker side of one's ideas about how they should deal with certain problems such as inner city violence. A lot of cinema is like that. Like all art, it is meant to bring out emotion but not necessarily ask you to act on it. That's what propaganda is. But what we do see in this argument that other forms of media and justification in society is dangerous. Just because you enjoy X doesn't mean you'll really do Y. And as a gamer, I can attest to the amount of times I've seen this argument come up, especially from conservative critics. Just because I've killed thousands of virtual people and it's like completing a task in my brain doesn't have the exact same logic. But I can understand how people in 1974 and now think the same way. Just because I murdered a bunch of Nazis in Wolfenstein 2 doesn't make me a killer. But it does make me want to kill Nazis because they're terrible, awful people who usually do terrible, awful things. But also, so that takes away the common sense logic that just because I do a million point combo in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 doesn't make me a skater. Lack of a better term. And that's like, holy shit, did we just- the thing about these kind of discussions is that it is fun to debate and talk about violence in the media and texts in general. But people like Plato and Socrates and Pauline Kael have already talked about this shit to death nearly a century ago. And they all came to the same conclusion. Because it's so much fun, Jan! Get it! Okay, not necessarily- yes, it is fun to watch, but also that it is a release that yes, people cheered in the cinemas, but after the film, they weren't going out and buying guns. Yes, during that time, there were a lot of people who were buying guns, and yes, it could be for a whole range of reasons, but a single film does not make a person a killer. 
If I were to review the first Death Wish, I'd give it two out of five very tired Charles Bronsons. It's an okay movie, but I'd heard time and time again that it was also the only serious film out of the Death Wish movies. But it's not. It's really just as awful as the rest of the series. The difference is, is that it's just one that tries to have at least, you know, some semblance of the original source material, albeit very poorly. It is made buoyant by a great director of photography and a beautiful soundtrack by Herbie Hancock that is as versatile as it is Gummy. So anyway, with the whole series primed and being one of the top 20 grossing movies of 1974, like any good film in the Hollywood cycle, the sequels began churning out. Okay, not, not straight away though, not, not right away, but here, that's right, eight years after Death Wish 1, Death Wish 2 was released in 1982. Oh, and holy fuck, it is, it is, it is a wild, wild ride. who's a journalist, writer, broadcaster, we sent you along to see the film. Uh, was the censor wrong, in your opinion? Well, I regret to say that I don't find it possible to take Death Wish 2 seriously as a film. To put it mildly, Death Wish 2 is Charles Bronson's 67th movie that he got paid $1.5 million for, and that's it. No, but to be fair, the story behind Death Wish 2 is about as crazy as the film in itself. That's mainly due to these two guys, Mannheim Golem and Torum Globus, two Palestinian filmmakers and producers who came to America with a dream. A dream of making movies that just don't make any fucking sense whatsoever. Now look, I could totally go into the history of these two and what happened when they purchased Canon Films, that was the distributor for Death Wish 2 back in 1979, but that's all wonderfully covered in this movie called Electric Boogaloo, The Wild Untold Story of Canon Films, which is one of the most enjoyable documentaries I've ever seen. Uh, I'll be using a lot of clips from them, so Mark Hartley, if you ever see this, please don't sue me or copyright claim this. I really respect you and your documentaries a whole bunch. I own them, I love them a whole bunch, they're, they're amazing, they're so good. While the doco only covers the Death Wish sequels briefly, the story behind the movie is just as crazy as the film in itself. First off, you may be asking, the movie was a huge hit, why didn't Paramount just produce a sequel and who the fuck are these two guys that always look like they just came from a buffet? Well, in 1981, Golan and Globus were having a bit of trouble securing the US market and began selling international movie rights for pictures that may or may not didn't actually exist. They announced at the Cannes Film Festival that there was going to be a sequel to Death Wish, a film that they did not have the rights to. And legendary film producer Dino De Laurentiis, yes that guy again, legendary film producer Dino De Laurentiis was responsible for Death Wish and all of these amazing films that you're seeing right now. He heard about what they were doing and threatened both Golan and Globus with a lawsuit so huge that they had to have a conversation. And that's when their plan worked. Their plan essentially being, now that we have your attention, let's have a meeting. And from there, they negotiated who gets what and how much, including Brian Garfield and the Death Wish co-producers Hal Landers and Bobby Roberts, how much they were all going to get from a Death Wish sequel. An agreement that says that they get a little bit of the cut, and if they make any sequels, they also get a bit of the cut. During negotiations, Brian offered both Death Wish and Death Sentence as source material, to which Golan replied with, we think our story is a better film story, and then refuse Brian any chance to actually write those films. The second movie is basically the first movie, but instead of the mother getting killed, the daughter being raped, it's the daughter being killed and a housekeeper being raped. And also the film is set in LA, and also the film was so rough around the edges, to put it lightly, it was rated X upon the least, and it's a, it's about as bloody and as horrible as the first film. It's, it's It does feel like it's a far worse movie, and it does feel a lot more racist. It could be simply due to the script, but then again, they, they got the research assistant for the movie Jaws to write the movie, David Engelback. So how could you go wrong? It's actually, there are a lot of ways you could go wrong. For example, Michael Winner is back as a director. This was a movie that just just felt like it was wrong for so many different reasons. And much like Garfield, David Engelback, who wrote the script, was extremely unhappy with the final product. He even exclaimed that the rape scenes were so much more gruesome than what he had initially written because the director, Michael Winner, and I do quote, wanted to get his Rape rocks off. A terrible thing, but it does happen. It is very much on the minds of the public, and I see no reason why any subject should be excluded from drama. This was just to get his rocks off. 
The script did not need it. Given that Winner did extensive rewrites of Engelback's script and then also shot extra footage to make things more intense, kind of makes sense. Engelback's original script, according to Engelback, was about the deteriorating state of criminal justice, and even stated that Paul Kersey is no hero. But I guess Winner didn't really get that message the first time, or the second time, or the third time, as we'll find out. When the film was released, it was mauled by the press, including in Winner's home pond of the UK. There were people who were furious about the film, and it was labelled a video nasty upon its original VHS release. To go into the film, I will, I guess, sort of explain some differences from the first film, I guess. The movie is basically the first film, but a lot more sluggish. The first act drags a lot, and there's there's a lot less focus on, like, the external repercussions for Paul Kersey's act. In fact, outside of getting shot and having his fiancée leave him, he doesn't really suffer any consequences. I actually really liked that change, that at the end of the movie, he basically has his wife, as in Charles Bronson's real-life wife, leave him and just leave the ring there. It almost kind of, like, says sends a, a really good message that maybe don't do these things because people will abandon you. The movie is also full of a lot of weird editing and a lot of ADR and a lot of plot conveniences. Also, I'm sorry that I have to kind of harp on this, but there is, there's a lot more nudity and there's a lot more rape sequences than the first film and they really drag on. Like they really kind of keep, they kind of, they, I mean, Engelback was right. Rather than wanting to have a story about the state of the criminal justice system, it's just an odd movie about a lone 60 year old man going around killing people who may or may not deserve it in increasingly weird and odd moments. And the ending is also really weird. The tone of the movie is just dirty and it never really rises above that. There's literally one shocking moment at the end of the movie where his fiance leaves his ring and after figuring out he's a vigilante, but then he just doesn't end up feeling cut up about it. Like there's, 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 there's just this sequence where he's kind of fine with it. And then the movie ends with this line. Sometimes I don't, but I'm fine. Betty's giving a new building party next Thursday. We'd like you to join us. I'll be there. Are you sure you're free? What else would I be doing? But I have to say, the thing that's wilder than the movie is all the shit that happened behind the scenes. And this is beyond the Golan and Globus effect. The producers originally wanted Isaac Hayes, composer of the hit movie Shaft and chef on South Park, who was also a Scientologist. They wanted him to do the soundtrack, but refused because the director was living next to Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page. And so he just asked him to do the soundtrack, and Jimmy Page had a bunch of synths and was like, yeah, all right, mate, I'll bloody do it. So anyway, here's your soundtrack, bro. It, honestly, it sounds really horrible, and it, it's very not much the tone of the film. Like, it's definitely made very much the tone of the 80s, but definitely not a Death Wish film, especially after that incredible jazz soundtrack from Herbie Hancock. Also, during the production of the film, Charles Bronson's brother Roy would visit the set often, and he was drunk out of his mind, and he would constantly ask his brother for money. But Charles wouldn't give him too much because he's worried that people would actually rob him, or even just decide to take advantage of him. The sad thing is, is that before production wrapped, Roy was found in a cheap LA motel stabbed in the buttocks. And it's, that, that's it. That's all I could read about the film. Like, that apparently happened. And Charles Brunson, like, lost a family. It was, it was real sad. The producers of the film really wanted a dirty look for the movie, so they shot in sleazy areas of Los Angeles and hired 20 off-duty cops to protect the cast and crew. Also, despite starring in 15 other movies together, this is also the only Death Wish film that stars Charles Bronson's wife, Jill Ireland. She's actually very good in the film, and she actually has like a level of balance to at least some of the awful arguments the film is making. The worst part about the film is that Winner returning as the director is more and more crass than I possibly could imagine. After Death Wish, Winner took a huge loss. Like, he was trying to direct a remake of The Big Sleep with an extremely drunk Robert Mitchum and One Ton Ton, the dog who saved Hollywood. I can't believe those are two real films, but I guess the, here they are. Anyway, Winner took on the directing role because he was saying that it was, now was the time to make a new Death Wish okay. film. I don't even think it has an ending, it just stops. It leaves all kinds of things up in the air and uh, it doesn't uh, resolve anything, it doesn't make a statement. I think the giveaway is that this is a sequel to a movie that was originally made in 1974. And that doesn't show that there's a tremendous demand for the sequel when they waited eight years to make it. I think it's more of a case of the people behind this film being totally bankrupt for any new ideas. They go back to Charles Bronson's last real big hit and they say, well, let's try to recycle. And there were a lot of other quotes about the state of America and just how horrible it is. 
And I'm gonna read some of them now, and I want you to know that I don't like this guy and I don't like what he's saying. Mugging is now a bigger issue in America. It's spread to towns where it's not a problem before. In Beverly Hills, instead of talking about other people's failed movies, thank god something has stopped them at last. They talk about their muggings. And about... About the sequel, Michael Winner stated that the movie was same but different. He began talking about the Rocky sequels, which were doing quite well in the 80s to be honest, and I mean they're doing quite well now. He said about those films and sequels in general, you don't see Sylvester Stallone move to the Congo and become a nurse. Here the look of LA is what's different. Besides, rape doesn't date. Yep, that's a that's a real quote from good old Michael, rape doesn't date winner. Fucking hell my Jesus. Is it all a giant send up? Knowing of Michael's wild sense of humour, I do rather wonder. There are signs of this, not just in such fine details as the last remaining rapist getting fried in an electric shock machine at the psychiatric hospital, but in the casting of some of the smaller parts. A psychiatrist, for example, who naturally represents weak, craven liberalism, has stumbled straight out of not the nine o'clock news, with a mad grin and a huge shock of black hair. Perhaps it's not surprising that Charles Bronson, even his, in his avenging commandos, Berry, looks a trifle zonked out by it all. Anyway, Death Wish 2 is not a good movie. It's not a great movie. It's not, it's barely a film. I give it one and a half dead NYPD detectives out of five. It's barely a movie. And while it does try to do more with the story, it's only redeeming qualities are honestly Jill Ireland's performance who outacts her husband in every single scene and just some great nighttime shots of LA. I do appreciate the cinematography, but not as much as the first film. But in terms of the actual release of the film and how well it did, it grossed $16 million in the US on its first run. And it had a bit of a rough time with the censors in the UK, but it's still made a lot of money there as well. In fact, there are multiple versions of the film circulating on VHS, digital, and DVD because of how heavily edited different versions of the film are depending on what region you lived in. Even on the IMDb trivia page, someone wrote an edited for TV version of this film contains an extended version of Anthony Francesca's scene as LA Police Commissioner. The extended TV version makes a great deal more sense. The edited cinematic version is pointless. Thanks, I guess, Death Wish 2 trivia contributor. So, the the question is, should you watch Death Wish 3 if you didn't like Death Wish 2? And the answer is, the final scene of Death Wish 3 is Charles Bronson shoots a rocket launcher at close range at someone and it hits him so hard it shoots him out of the movie and that's how the movie ends with this woman deciding that the gang is over by doing this weird hand symbol. Okay, now, before I get to all of that, I'm really sorry that I do have to go into a little bit of history as well. I, I know it's not the reason why you clicked on this video, but I have to tell you a story about Bernie gets before I talk about Death Wish 3. Good evening. It is Christmas Eve in New York, and the talk of the town is not peace on earth, but the violence among us, this time in the subways, where a vigilante and his gun brought terror this past weekend. The victims were four teenagers. Eyewitness News has been on top of this story from the very start of it, and tonight we have team coverage as police press their search for the vigilante. The year is 1984, and in December of 1984, four men are shot and wounded by a man named Bernard Getz. They're on a train, and it happens a few days before Christmas. Getz boarded a train from the 14th Street Manhattan stop and was faced with four young men. They stated later that they were all on their way to rub a video arcade, and it was 1984, so it checks out. During the incident, one of the boys asked Getz how he was doing. Getz says fine. The boys all give signals to one another, according to Getz, and then asked him for five dollars. Getz then quickly pulls a handgun because of this interaction, and fires multiple shots, wounding all four of them. If I had more bullets, I would have shot them all again and again. The old, my problem was I ran out of bullets, and I was gonna, I was gonna gouge one of the guys' eyes out with my keys afterwards. You, 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 you can't understand this. I know you can't understand this. That's fine. The, reason, the only reason I didn't do it is because he had changed his look. Getz later goes to court where he testifies that the boys were trying to rob him. The boys state that they were signaling that they noticed Getz had a gun and were merely panhandling and not actually demanding money. During the trial, they talk more about how horrible the incident was and how it left them with a lot of PTSD. Shortly after the initial shots, other passengers fled the train carriage, knocking down other passengers in their way. Getz saw two women who were immobilized in fear and checked whether they were injured, but nothing terrible happened to them. Getz was then approached by the train conductor who was helping the other passengers. The conductor then asked Getz if he was a cop and then asked him to hand over the gun he was still carrying. Getz then left the carriage and just jumped the tracks, ran to Chamber Street Station where he left the Manhattan Railway system on foot. Getz was later then labeled the Subway Vigilante 
and was supported by groups such as the Guardian Angels, the NRA's Roy Innes, and the Congress of Racial Equality. Now, why mention all this? Because I felt, reading the story, that it was essentially Death Wish playing out in a real-life context, and what would actually happen if somebody tried to pull some Charles Bronson shit. Without going into further detail, despite the fact that no one was killed, Getz was tried before a Manhattan jury and was acquitted of attempted murder and a first-degree assault. However, he was convicted to six months in jail and a year's worth of psychiatric treatment including five years probation, 200 hours community service, and a $5,000 fine for what he had done. It also doesn't end there, because 12 years later in 1996, a civil suit is brought against Getz from the young men he basically tried to assault. He was then tried, he lost. The jury found that Getz had acted extremely recklessly and would deliberately inflicted emotional st- on Daryl Cabey, one of the victims of the crime. The jury awarded Cabey $43 million, $18 million for pain and suffering, and $25 million for punitive damage. Gets then filed for bankruptcy upon receiving the lost, and then he kind of became this weird anti-hero in New York history. The worst part of it all is that Getz never really learned from the lesson. He gave interviews about the situation, including being interviewed by Nancy Grace on Larry King Live, an interview with Opie and Anthony, and in 2001, just after 9-11, Getz tried to run for mayor for New York City. He eventually lost to the Libertarian candidate and inspiration for Cosmo Kramer on Seinfeld by just... 359 votes. That is the legacy of the man they called Bernie Getz, the subway vigilante. Now, with all of that out of the way, do you know what the film that they released shortly after the subway vigilante incident happened? And in fact was rushed to theaters to make sure that they released it to help capitalize on the subway vigilante? Michael Winner's Death Wish 3. Bronson's back in New York, bringing justice to the streets. Charles Bronson, Death Wish 3. Death Wish 3 is a fucking mess of a movie that a lot of people have talked about, but I thought I'd give my small spin on it. The plot is basically Brunson gets a letter from an old buddy named Charlie. Charlie is murdered. Brunson is arrested. Then he's recruited by a cop to take out some of the scum on the street. And then he does it with the help of a few old people. And there's also a lot of like Home Alone style traps that are really, really kind of fucked up and evil. Anybody opening the window raises the nail. And then he falls in love with this woman, and then there's all these gangs, and then the gangs work together, and then they have this weird symbol on their forehead that's kind of like a Nazi symbol, but like, but also kind of like a Native American thing. And then he just begins to murder a bunch of them, like, with the community. It's, it's a, it's a very weird and wild film. The plot doesn't really make a lot of sense, and it's all leading up to this amazing 20 minute sequence at the end, which I'll get to. But overall, the movie is atrocious for so many reasons. Starting off with the score and the directing, yet again, again is just piss poor. <sighs> Firstly, the score is bad because guess what? It's just leftover score from the second movie. Jimmy Page is credited with the score at the start of the film, but they had so much leftover music from Jimmy Page. Apparently he recorded hours upon hours upon hours for the second movie, and they just didn't have the budget to have some more score, so they just reused some of that music because it was just a lot easier. Also, a lot of the notes that I had when I was originally writing this script was actually covered by uh, Red Letter Media who obviously are a huge inspiration for this channel. And so if you look, if you want to watch them mock it mercilessly, here's a link to the best of the worst episode about that, A Very Canon Christmas. But first, I, like, look, let me just rant about the direction of this film. The directing is so bad in this film that there are some moments that literally make no sense whatsoever and simply just show the lack of talent Bronson and his surrounding cast as actors. It, in fact, if you told me that this was everyone's first day as an actor, I would 100% believe you. My friend Will Lee's coming. He'll help out. Who's moving? Oh, you'll see. Also, a lot of the audio is 80 yard again, and certain scenes that, that just seem like they were edited by a coke addicted monkey. You know who's to blame for that? Arnold Crust who doesn't actually exist, because that's just Michael Winner. Michael Winner pretended to be the editor of this film and then just put a fake name on it. Also, according to the IMDb trivia page for the movie, this is actually true and it's why I told the story before, the film was rushed into theaters so quickly to capitalize on the trial of Bernie Getz that it was sent out without any color correction on the final print. That's right, the film came out 
and it had no real color correction, so it kind of looked like this for most of the film. Winner rushed the movie so hard that it just had this gross yellowy tinge on most of the original prints. But regardless, because they capitalized on this event, the film made $10 million in its original run. The writing is abysmal and is entirely the fault of Michael Edmonds. Psych, got you again. That guy also doesn't exist because the original writer Don Jacoby hated the film so much and then Winner went in and did so many rewrites, he told Michael Winner to take his name off the script and eventually off the film. It's, it's so weird how much Michael Winner absolutely decimated this film series. Like the first three films, yes the first one is okay at best, but by the third film, Winner was going intentionally out of his way to film more gory and rape filled scenes just so he could, I guess, tell the st- I don't know what his point was. There's just so many like pieces of the script as well that has like these little t minor setups and payoffs, but there's so few far in between and they're shot so poorly that it's hard to make any kind of cohesive sense out of it. There's also these minor pieces of symbolism that are just so ham-fisted. You might as well just replace Winner's own directing hands with a full Bataki dinner. I also remembered, because I was reading the book while I was, you know, getting to this point in the script that Bronson's Loose also talks about the fact that Brian Garfield remembers seeing an early screening of the first Death Wish film and he talked about how he really didn't like Bronson being cast as Paul Benjamin, now Kersey, and he talked to Winner about this very weird slapdash directorial style. Garfield recounts in two or three unrelated scenes, three nuns in black habits wander across the background and Brian Garfield calls them cheap distractions. But then that's something I noticed too, here's the footage of that. When Garfield confronted Winner about this scene, Winner said, they're symbols my dear boy. And then Garfield asked, symbolizing what? And to which Winner answered, nothing darling, they're just symbols. And just, I, I think about that so much going through these films, especially the third film when there's just bits like this with the cockroach and it just it just really shows how much of a hack that winner is he's, he's as big as a hack as like troy duffy or richard kelly these people who got very lucky with their first film or first series of films and then just kept making garbage for the rest of their life I also find it really odd that in each movie the formula only changes just enough to make it look like our new movie, but they, like for example, most of the time they introduce a love interest which ultimately they kill off or dispose of completely, but the only time this doesn't happen in Death Wish 2, and in Death Wish 3 it's kind of the only time where you know that they consummate the relationship. Like, and also the only reason in the third film that she dies is to help kick things into the gory ending that we were promised from the title. Speaking of the film's title, I found out also while reading about this film that they changed the film from Death Wish 3 with the Roman numeral 3 to the number 3 because the canon group read a study that most Americans don't know how Roman numerals work. Apparently 50% of Americans in the 1980s didn't know how Roman numerals work so they felt like well we need to put a number here so we can at least call this a sequel. On top of all of this Bronson was 64 years old by the time this film was made and he was paid an extra 1.5 million dollars to be in the film which is you know a lot considering that the film cost cost less than $10 million to begin with. But in the absolute best way possible, Michael Winner clearly didn't know this was going to be his legacy, but just went all out for the third film. This is like one of the things that I can say is a positive, is that the explosions and stunt work are just amazing. They really, really elevate the film above the previous two films, which were just kind of violent revenge flicks. Also, this is the first film appearance of Alex Winter, someone who I greatly respect as obviously Bill S. Preston Esquire, but also now as a fantastic documentarian and filmmaker there's also one moment in the film where Bronson had to hit Winter with a lead pipe and Bronson exclaimed he couldn't do it because he looks like a fucking choir boy and was afraid that he would lose his audience if he beat Winter. The film is gory as hell and obviously there are certain scenes that elevate this above regular schlock. It is terrible in the best way possible. It's also a weird training manual on how to take out thugs in your own time more so than the first two films. Like I mentioned before the movie isn't all bad and the one thing I can definitely praise is the production design. They really make Thatcher's 80s Britain look like an American war zone. Because despite the fact that the movie takes place in New York City, the wonderful people who did the production design and set dressing made the made this awful town in London look like a piece of US soil. In fact, there's a rumor that Winner really wanted to shoot in the UK just because he hated traveling to the US. It also shows that, you know, whether it was UK or US conservatism, it really did a number on the urban population. Also, the body count in this film is five times higher than the previous film, with more than 80 people killed on screen. It is ridiculous the amount of bloodshed that's in this film, and I'm not, I can't wait to talk about the fourth film, because, uh, spoilers, it is my favorite out of all 
all five of these films. There are a few good things about this film, as long as you don't think of it as a Death Wish film. If this was a separate piece of cinema that just happened to style Bronson, I would be so happy about that. But because it's trying to continue this very odd legacy that Michael Winner was clearly proud of, it shows what happens to a film series when, you know, you stop taking things seriously. Very similar to what happens to the Pirates of the Caribbean series, or even the Fast and the Furious series, that it gets to a point where even the filmmakers are aware that nobody is taking these films seriously, and it elevates their creativity and, to some degree, their ego. But it's kind of sad because, ultimately, it still has the exact same message, that killing people who probably deserve it but isn't really justified without looking at greater ramifications is justified in this context. It's, it's kind of a bummer, but I will say that there are just some amazing line readings and scenes in this film that brought me such joy. The first two films are such buzz kills in comparison and are so stupid but don't know they're stupid. They're like an idiot who prints off their PhD and thinks that they're qualified to do medicine. But this just seems like this. We're still in the fucking car, what's it to you? It's my car. How are you going to die? And this. They killed the giggler, man. They killed the giggler! And this particular wonderful moment that Brunson has with a neighborhood kid. Yeah! Right on, man! They made a film that is the standard of exploitation and a standard for 80s movies because it's beloved all over the world by both of those types of people. I really like that. I think that, that people really surrounded themselves around this film because it is a great representation of what those films can do. I think they know it's dumb and ridiculous and over the top and I think that they're not taking as serious a message from the first two films. I don't think anyone is taking Death Wish 3 seriously at all and I don't think that they could have scenes like this. Yeah! yeah right I think <laughs> without some sense of self awareness. I think Winner, however, was taking it all very seriously and it's kind of sad. The man was an atrocious director and there are many stories that Alex Winter tells about the insane antics of this man who had so little power and so little money that made everybody miserable at the end of the working day. In fact, there's a story that Winter recounted during a screening of Death Wish 3 where Winner was smoking cigars every day in Britain on set like he was some sort of shitty recreation of Winston Churchill. He had an assistant that had to walk no more than three feet behind him and no less than like two feet 11 inches or something really that crazy with his cigars in a bag and as soon as he missed the calibration he was fired so there was a new assistant like every day no nope, <laughs> not a joke i think that's a story that really defines someone as a megalomania like you just put his photo next to the definition and i will be extremely happy on Again, I highly suggest you read the IMDb trivia pages for these movies if you're interested and watch Electric Boogaloo. Mark Hartley does a fantastic job of summarizing these stories better than I could ever possibly think of doing. The sad part about all of this is that at this point in the franchise, even Bronson was so sick of these movies and was so upset when he found out that Winner had shot and added extra gory shots of thugs being beaten against Bronson's wishes. He wanted to take the films more seriously, but he also wanted to tone down some of the violence. After this movie, Charles Bronson publicly stated that he recommended that people not imitate his character Paul Kersey from the Death Wish movies. Look, Death Wish 3 is a fun ride, but ultimately it is a record that isn't changing its tune. I do, however, really like the film and I understand why it has such a greater legacy compared to the other ones. That being said, I can only give it four grumpy Charles Bronsons out of five, simply because, look, I think that there is a lot to praise about the film from its exploitation standpoint. If I had to give it a real rating, it's still a two because Michael Winner is an an awful director and frankly an awful person considering what I read about what he had done to his girlfriends in the 80s but that's neither here nor there. Moving on from Death Wish 3 I do I do feel like there is something to be said about the films as they go along. I actually think that they get better. And it's so weird because so many people have told me the opposite, that when I was starting Death Wish 4, I had such ridiculous high hopes because of how ridiculous Death Wish 3 is. But Death Wish 4 is amazing. <laughs> Before I talk about Death Wish 4, I do have to talk a bit about the backstory behind the film again. Right before shooting began on Death Wish 4, Bronson's wife, Jill Ireland, 
had finished writing her first book titled Life Wish, which was about her battle with breast cancer and her life with Bronson. Bronson and Ireland were a happy couple, but you could see by the fourth film, despite Bronson's wonderful life and family, he was really only doing these films for a paycheck. When filming began on Death Wish 4, he was now a 65 year old man playing a man in his late 40s and was still taking down thugs like he was Christian Bale's Batman, but he still moved like Bobby De Niro in The Irishman. I felt like at this point in the franchise that making fun of Charles Bronson and his lack of acting was not the point of these films. He's not an extremely talented actor, he comes in and he plays the role that he has written. He's doing a lot with what was written initially. He had rarely opened up about the film or its meaning, but you could tell it was weighing on him dreadfully. He did speak in 1987 with the Sun Sentinel, stating about the fan base of the film, you often run into people who are fans of the Death Wish character, he said slowly. He was carefully choosing his words, and he looked up at the reporter and said, they feel like he's doing what they would like to do, kind of like the Devil's Disciple. They can identify with it without getting involved themselves. They like to see someone kill their own snakes. You wait around for the law to take care of it and it's a long process. They like to see immediate punishment. And it was very reminiscent of how Alan Moore would talk about people who were fans of his character Rorschach from Watchmen. Bronson detested this character by this point, but the films never truly reflected that resentment or that distaste in general. Bronson admits in the same interview that he despises the celebrity lifestyle but considered himself an extrovert. He also notes that he doesn't keep a library of his own films. At home, he said, I may have one of my movies. My agent once sent me a copy of a film. I think it was the Valachi Papers, but who knows where it is. When I started out, I enjoyed working in films, and when they started paying me, it was a real treat. In this business, you look for longevity and endurance so you can make a living. I've been doing it for 36 years. I was sometimes uneasy about the quality of the parts played and about the director. Oh, boom, many times, you know, because you run into directors all the time who do not fit the subject that you're shooting, or you're not simpatico with the director, or the, sim the, the director with you. The directors I've worked with, like Terence Young, mm -hmm. were very intelligent, very talented, and they can, they can work with anybody, you know, and, uh, and get along and make a good product. If the subject matter is there, the material must be there, of course. But some directors will take a good material and ruin it. You know, and it's, it's of course, actors too. Now, thinking of Bronson and thinking of this interview, for the penultimate Death Wish movie from Bronson, what can I truly say about it that hasn't already been said about the previous film? Death Wish 4 is a sick fucking movie and I fucking love it. It looks exactly what I imagined a Death Wish movie to look like. Also, it looks like if someone asked you to show what the 80s looked and felt like, it would be Death Wish 4. The film is very disjointed and the script logic is so faulty at the best of times that you almost try to piece together your own film and why it was written, but it has never been so right to call this a Death Wish movie. The plot is relatively the same as all of the other films. Bronson is in a city, he has a love interest, they have someone he cares about, they eventually die, there's a lot of- Whoa! Hold on! What the fuck is this? The plot is evolving? Oh wait, wait, the, the, the Death Wish formula is evolving? What is happening? Oh no, the Death, the Death Wish movies are evolving. They're becoming, it's evolved into a good movie. <laughs> That's right, Death Wish 4, while occurring during, honestly, one of the saddest times in Bronson's life, it may actually be the best movie in the series. And what the fuck are you doing here? I was making a sandwich. <laughs> While it may have all of the staples of the other Death Wish movies, the film borrows a lot from Akira Kurosawa's work. I'm not even kidding. This isn't some sort of like egg-headed joke. Akira Kurosawa made a fantastic film called Yojimbo, and this film has a very, very similar plot, which is about a lone wolf warrior who pits two rival forces against one another. Because guess what? Bronson doesn't kill that many people in this film, but he does pit two rival gangs against one another, and it is so smart and so clever that, I, honestly, it took me until halfway through the film before I was like, I've I've seen that. Wait a second, I've seen this plot before. That's right. Without Akira Kurosawa, a famous Japanese director, for if he didn't exist, Star Wars wouldn't fucking exist, nor a lot of cinema in general. Bronson doesn't just kill everybody in this film and get away with it. He is supplied with weaponry from this rich guy who sets this whole plan into action. And it's so devilishly clever that because these films are so dumb and so ridiculous that I actually wasn't even expecting the plot twist about a third of the way in through the film. That Bronson's being set up by this rich dope who actually is a part of a rival gang. 
you. You're Nathan White? I ought to know my own name. Who was the man that was in here last week? Oh, there was no one here last week. I've been in Europe for three months. There's an actual twist. There's an actual idea that is set up and paid off and then I was actually surprised in the fucking Death Wish series. It, look, it could be because I've been huffing paint every day to just feel something during a pandemic or it could be the fact that these films are so dog shit that I can't believe that there was an actual film that made me feel something beyond just general disbelief and absurdity. It actually made me so giddy to see this awful three-day rental action movie have such an actual golden nugget of plot structure that I just, that I, I actually think this film might be actually good. It's also like something to say that the film also has some kind of message about the exploitation of the rich on the middle and lower classes. It also talks about how bad cops are at their job and the corruption within the police force. Most of the cops that you see in the film are actually working for rival gangs. And because the film is set in Los Angeles, I, to be fair, I'm not that surprised, buddy. Also, this is the first Death Wish film that isn't directed by Michael Winner and doesn't have any of his tampering. Also, the first film that doesn't have a whole bunch of sexual assault or nudity peppered throughout the whole film. It is so incredible that in Death Wish 4, they removed what Michael Winner felt were the essential parts about Death Wish, and it still works. In fact, it's fantastic because it doesn't happen. Sure, there's, there's, okay, there's, there's a lot of people who die, especially there's a lot of women who die and a lot of poor writing around women, and that sucks, you know, in a whole different awful way, but the film tries not to be as crass as the first few films, and it really tries to focus on Bronson as a character. It can be very, very nasty. If I want to be. Ah! So can I. There is this incredible opening sequence that is technically a dream, but it really shows Bronson's own psychology. And then there's just this, this reference to, I think, Empire Strikes Back, where Bronson is looking at himself as the actual perpetrator of this awful crime. And it's like, is he as awful as the people he kills? Because the writer of the film, Gail Morgan Hickman, talked about creating a more cerebral idea of Kersey. And I think that it shows promise in this opening scene. It shows that he is just slow slowly being degraded by these films, much like the audience to some degree, but ultimately it never delivers. It, it, like this first scene is absolutely incredible because it's almost like a parody of the previous Death Wish movies, but it has this pullback and reveal that I think is, it could be genius. It's it's so hard to tell that there are just these minor divergence and these, these fantastic scenes, like this scene set in this oil field where he kills a bunch of people, but he does it in this slow meticulous way that he's almost this like Terminator-like threat, but really, the but the real reason is because he's old and he probably didn't want to move that much. It's just so weird that there are just these, these scenes that could be good if they were in another film and that could have been better. That being said, there are some sequences that have good setups and payoffs. For example, Bronson's new love interest plays a reporter in Los Angeles and she's trying to find some dirt on drug dealers who killed her daughter. In the opening scene, she tries to do some undercover shit and she talks to this guy and then that guy comes back at the end of the movie and because he has her details, she gets kidnapped to kicking off the final act of the movie. It's it's so good. Also, there's a lot of great cinematography in this film that really shows off 80s Los Angeles that would just make any Vaporwave fan fall to their knees and praise a huge statue of Helios. Look, my only complaint about the film is all the acting is just terrible. There is just so much terrible acting in the film, but I think it's there to counterbalance Bronson's acting, who, which is so wooden. Bronson's acting is so wooden, I can get more emotion out of this tree in my backyard. There's a lot of weird shit that happened behind the scenes in this film, and you can kind of tell that it was made for $5 million, but you also can't tell that Bronson was paid $4 million for this role. At the time, Bronson was in his late 60s and was annoyed he was filming these movies, and he hated it so much that he asked Gail Hickman to stay on set to do daily rewrites. The writer had to come up with new dialogue and new sequences on the set. And honestly, I think the film is better for it. There is some amazing set pieces and just bits of dialogue like this between the mobsters. Who does that punk Zacharias think he's playing with? Doesn't make sense. Why would Zacharias hit us? Because he's trying to start a war. Somebody's knocking up his men too. Man, I don't believe that for one minute. And Brunson's one-liners are just a little bit weird. Who the fuck are you? Death. 
In this scene here, which, watch as Bronson, a master of espionage and disguise, gets out of this weirdly tricky situation with mobsters by showing up as a wine dealer and then fooling veteran action star Danny Trejo as he may or may not recognize I know him. your face. Did you ever live in San Francisco? I'm from Idaho. Hey, I got a brother in Idaho. What city? Boise? Boise. Boise. I know you. I never forget a face. What the hell? I did not edit any of that. That's how the scene plays out. I do have to note that John P. Ryan might be the most blandest surprise villain, that once he's revealed his true form as it becomes so over the top and ludicrous that having your final shootout in a roller rink parking garage might be so ridiculous and then turns into awesome once they go into the roller rink. Sure. It's fine showing scenes from these movies out of context, but even in the movie they are so fucking dumb and hilarious that I couldn't stop myself from having my jaw open as wide as possible the entire time. The crazy thing about the writer of this film is that the only reason Gail Morgan Hickman got the job is because he had just finished writing Brunson's last picture, Murphy's Law, and that was such a hit and Brunson liked him so much that they just basically decided to go with whatever Hickman wrote. There were literally hundreds of scripts. People wanted to make a Death Wish movie because Golan and Globus were just so amped about making more of them. Spec scripts and premises were coming in from all over the world, but Hickman won out because he had this original existential and psychological profile of Paul Kersey, Golan and Globus were like, this is fantastic, let's just go with this. I'm not going anywhere until I know who this is and what the hell it is you want. However, before production began, both Golan and Globus sat him down and were just kept insisting to make the movie, and I do quote, more for a Death Wish audience. Basically, just dumb it down as much as you can and let's just try and get away with as many illegal permits as possible. The weird thing with dumbing it down, it's actually the most straightforward forward of all of the Death Wish films, and yet it has a level of complexity by introducing these rival gangs. I told you. I knew Rodriguez was scamming us, man. You can't trust any of them Colombians. Yeah, I know what you mean. Hey, you want me to take care of it? Oh, no, no, no. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of that fuck personally. The film doesn't rely on how gross or horrible Los Angeles is, it's just a setting for the movie. But it takes a look at the greater ideas around corruption and that maybe muggers aren't responsible for the majority of the worst crimes that this city has. It's actually these people who are rich and wealthy who are destroying most of Los Angeles. It's actually this great critique about conservatism, especially in a place like California. There is just a minor bit of coherence and these films are elevated beyond what they could possibly be. It isn't just about murderous rampage. Because a loved one is dead, there is a purpose that drives Kersey in this film that is more psychological than any other film. It's not your money I'm after, Kersey. It's your professional skill. I want you to kill someone for and there's also a reason behind doing the most minor things, like throwing water in Danny Trejo's face. What the hell? Also, I gotta say, just because of these scenes alone, the dummy budget on this film must have been crazy, because I counted no less than four times they definitely used a dummy for these scenes, but they also look like, I, I, I had a closer look on the Blu-ray version, they also look like they might have used the exact same dummies over and over again. He's such a jerk, I wish he'd drop dead. <laughs> It adds to the ridiculous nature of these films and series as a whole. I, it, it's just so fucking funny and just so ridiculous. There's no rallying cry from the neighborhood like in the third film. There's no gory nihilism like the first two films and the, and the one-liners are just a little bit better. Who are you? I'm the guy that set you up. Why? I don't even know the girl. I do. <laughs> This is what I felt I was promised with the Death Wish series. When I talked to friends, when I talked to, to, to fellow creators about these films, I was shocked by the time the fact that nobody talked about how great Death Wish 4 is. So I honestly give Death Wish 4 four screaming sex workers with hearts of pure gold out of five. It is a brilliant film. It is, it is so dumb and it's so ridiculous that 
I just, it's, it's, it's hard to top it. So after going out on such a high point with Death Wish 4, why make a Death Wish 5? No, I'm actually serious. Why make a Death Wish 5? Because at the time, Canon Films was doing so bad that this film didn't have a place in their production lineup. They decided to greenlight a Death Wish 5, but it was such a huge flop upon release. Why did they make it? Well, guess where Death Wish 4 wasn't a huge flop? That's right, on home video and Laserdisc. Now before I briefly talk about Death Wish 5, I have to talk about how video saved Gollum and Globus from total bankruptcy, at least for a decade. Sure, they eventually went bankrupt, running canon into the ground, but before that happened they were a surefire hit on the burgeoning world of home video releases. Now while a lot of people on the internet may barely remember home video, it was a huge innovation in the 1970s, but only truly affordable in the 1980s. By then, nearly 11 million homes in the United States owned a VCR and were ecstatic about being able to buy and rent movies from places like this. That some how still exist, even as an Airbnb. The weird thing is, is that the history of movies was never really kind to anything that failed on its first try. When movies had failed at the box office, they could succeed and live a second life on home video. This helped in the 1980s with bringing to life horror films and cult classics that had a limited or short run in the theaters. It could even bring new classics to light, the most famous story being the critically panned and box office failure that was Stanley Kubrick's 1980 horror film, The Shining. While the film barely made its budget back on its initial release, Maybe because releasing your film against The Empire Strikes Back is not a good idea. But with its original release, it failed. And then its initial release on home video, people loved the new cover art because it kind of made sense rather than what Saul Bass was going for here. When Warner Brothers finally started to distribute it in home video stores, it actually started to get new buzz by a new audience that typically were fans of horror films. With a re-release in the summer of the same year, the film eventually made bank and in 2018, the film was selected for preservation by the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. But more importantly, several awful video essays have been made about the film and are honestly just dreck, just pure and utter dreck. So why is there a Death Wish 5? The answer is, is because Golan and Globus knew that if the film failed in cinemas, they could make it all back on video rentals. Media Home Entertainment released Death Wish 4 on video in April of 1988 and paid Canon a $2 million advance for exclusive video rights. Over a hundred thousand cassettes were sold to rental stores. It became one of the best selling videos of 1988. And that's not including all the Laserdisc copies that are still floating around. Can you believe this was a format 30 years ago? Like this is this was the vinyl record version of DVD and it's somehow still extremely popular and extremely expensive if you pay for stuff on eBay. Now, Death Wish 5 is a movie. What can I truly say? It is a return to form, but for the worst parts of the Death Wish series. The plot is relatively much like the other movies or at least the first three movies. It's set in New York City. It's got a love interest. She dies about a third of the way through the film. And by this point, the movie is such a farce that at the best of times it's a lackluster attempt to capture the franchise and at worst it's Charles Bronson just looking old. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to age shame people, I'm not I'm not trying to be ageist, but he just looks really old. The plot is very similar to the first two movies, but Kersey is dating a fashion designer who's definitely 20 years his junior, but he has to take on the mob after said fashion designer is murdered in, honestly, one of the worst ways I've ever seen committed to film. But then he is also trying to protect the now orphan daughter of said fashion designer, but the daughter is the daughter of the villain of the movie, who's straight up racist. It's, it's really wonderful that after all of this time with everybody talking about how racist the Death Wish films, it just come out and just says the gamer word right at the top of the film. Makes you the head and you talk to me like that. It's really weird because the whole daughter of the villain plot thing, like it, it's, he's also under investigation and he's been under investigation for about 16 years and has also been linked to multiple murders, but yet the daughter is still somehow allowed to live with a suspected criminal, but like, I, it's weird. I don't wanna go, Paul, I wanna stay with you. What's happening here? What's going on? It's super weird. The movie continues its tradition of being quite verbose in justifying Kersey's murders. They treat every single villain as an exaggerated portion of not necessarily a rampant urban society gone wrong, but just, just some of the weirdest ways I've ever seen someone committed to being a villain in just some of the worst ways possible. Hey, Hector. Yeah. It's something you're wearing. I don't know, Tommy. Check out. Scumbag. <laughs> 
There's also some of the weirdest ways I've ever seen someone murdered in a movie, including the scene where Brunson poisons a cannoli with cyanide, which leads to one of the most intense reactions to death I've ever seen in a movie. And there's also a scene where there's a deeply paranoid mobster who is uh, like also like he's in this really highly guarded fortress but then he goes outside and is murdered with a bum placed in a robotic soccer ball that Kersey buys from a toy store and he controls it and then <laughs> There are also some truly insane pieces of dialogue and delivery, and to continue the tradition of the Death Wish movies, some of the worst ADR I've ever heard. Hector, what? I'm not gonna take no for an answer. You're staying for dinner. You are. Hey, can I see your gun? No. No. That being said, there is a few really great moments and a few gory scenes for the people who are fans of the exploitation parts. There is some cinematography in this film that also looks like it's straight out of a Michael Bay movie or even like a John Wick film. This scene alone is brilliant and goofy and I love it. Children, please, my, my children, this is the house of the Lord. But also, I just felt like the film was just not really saying anything or doing anything. It just felt like another Death Wish film. It just sucks because it was 1994 by the time this film came out. And it felt like the screenwriter was trying to get into the swing of what action movies were like at the time. There's a lot more black humor. There's a lot more stereotyped characters that still have a bit of a personality, even if they're just a part of the villain archetype. There was definitely a kick on effect from the string of Die Hard ripoffs that came out shortly after the success of the first two films. People were trying to compete with the likes of Shane Black and Quentin Tarantino and obviously failing. The problem is, is that good dialogue and dark humor is hard to come by. Oh, I'm sorry, did I break your concentration? And they require a level of nuance and subtlety and Bronson and the team of filmmakers here have none of that. Look at some of these one-liners. I didn't think it would be this easy, Kersey. The truly sad thing about the Death Wish movies and what I had heard from friends is that it's deeply misogynistic and racist and while I definitely had the first part of that throughout all of the films, it's definitely racist in terms of the message it portrays. While I think that the first three films definitely have that undertone and there's definitely in that who they kill in the first three films, this is the first time that it's extremely blatant. Michael Park's Tommy O'Shea is a great character but he's so easy to hate for so many different reasons. He's not only just straight up racist, he's just mean to everybody and it just, it just feels like they finally wrote a villain that was worth writing, but then he's so different from Bronson's stone cold exterior that you think it would have at least elevated Bronson to be a little bit more charismatic. But also on top of this, all of the villains are racist and all of his cronies are misogynist. And it's just, there's just a lot of gross misogyny here that I just don't appreciate. And I can't be too surprised when the film is built around the world of New York fashion, but look. And then there's also this weirdly transphobic scene where a guy who has a dandruff problem dresses a woman and then violently beats her Percy's love interest, and I think it's trying to play up the psychological damage because he dresses like a woman. It's I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> look at that. You want a face you've got. Look at it. Not me. You. Look, look at your face. Look, look at that beautiful face. Take a good look at it. Because I'm gonna have to take it away from you. It's just really gruesome and uncomfortable and it goes on for a long time. And while Michael Winner didn't direct this film, it just continues this tradition of exploitation cinema that just doesn't feel, it just feels so out of place. It just doesn't feel like it's meant to be here. It's just kind of odd because it's trying to continue this tradition of exploitation cinema that obviously started in the 70s. From 1974 to 1994, Death Wish was an incredible series that kind of capitalized on the fear of Americans and then tried to double down on it by being as gruesome and as horrible as it possibly could. The problem is, is, is that this movie coming out in 1994 can't really do that anymore. It's hard to shock audiences after you've been doing it for 20 years. Stop. Oh, what the fuck's happening now? Oh, man. Man. And 1994 was a truly groundbreaking year in cinema. Think about all of the other films that Death Wish 5 had to compete with. Because with all of that, the circle was complete. 
where independent and newly reduced restrictions in cinema had helped Death Wish exist and breathe new life into movies, by the time the series was completed or at its end, it was considered tacky and excessive and modern audiences were so uncomfortable with it that they didn't go see it. The film only ended up grossing $2 million on a $5 million budget and that's not even talking about the money that they paid Bronson to come back for a fifth time. The newly formed 21st Century Film Corporation formed from the ashes of Canon Films had turned out to be another flop and not by any fault of their own. I will not let let bad filmmaking get in the way of bad box office because we've seen this time and time again. The movie was a mess from the get-go, but look, uh, there were three different directors coming and going before production even began. Eventually they settled on shooting as much of the movie in Toronto for tax purposes, and Bronson, now pushing 71 years of age, spoke with the screenwriter Michael Collery and asked for Kersey to be more sympathetic and less violent. And obviously we, we kind of saw how that turned out. <laughs> To make matters worse, the film was eventually only released in a few cinemas in New York and LA, and the release date was set by 21st Century Films on January 16th, 1994. This sadly happened the next day on January 17th. Okay, we've got another aftershock. Here in the Channel 4 newsroom, as you folks, there's no surprise. For any folks this morning, we've been hit with a major earthquake. Right now we're trying to basically gather some more information, trying to figure out where this has been centered. How much of we can take a look around that right now, but half the newsroom behind me has been disheveled. A lot of television monitors knocked off the shelves. Uh, basically a lot of dust kicking around here. We're trying to figure out again where this uh, earthquake has been centered. We begin tonight with a big picture from NBC's Larry Carroll. The quake struck an area where more than a million people live. So far, at least 24 people are known dead. Hundreds have been injured. Early estimates of property damage are in excess of half a billion dollars. That's right. The morning after the release of Death Wish 5, one of the cities had a 6.7 megaton earthquake. It rocked the city of Los Angeles and caused more than $86 billion of damage. It injured 8,700 people and killed 52. So you know, something that may have greatly affected the box office and those wanting to maybe see the film. That and the list of reviews panning the film and its mediocrity were very brutal. Like myself, many critics noticed that Bronson could barely give a fuck or even keep his eyes open during the film. One critic noted that Bronson looked terminally bored and another saying that the film's plot was just as tired as the previous films and felt older than its original mold. It was time to pack up and pack it in for the series. Because let me end this video essay with, I guess, some really sad moments. The movie ends with this scene. Thanks, Lieutenant. Hey, Lieutenant, if you need any help, give me a call. It's intended to be overly hopeful where, you know, rather than Kersey moving to a new city or going back into hiding, or even just concluding that his work is done like the previous films, it just ends with this really lazy moment. It's also tragic in its own weird way because this was the last film Bronson ever made, and it kind of leaves the moment bittersweet knowing that he never really acted again in a theatrical release. Sure, he made a trilogy of TV movies called Family of Cops. Ugh, fucking hell. But eventually he stopped acting altogether in the mid 90s and he passed away in 2003. But that didn't stop 21st Century Films because they announced in 1995 Death Wish 6, the new vigilante. No, they, 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 they felt like they could keep the series going, hoping to make the movie without Bronson, but no one was biting and the film ended up being completely scrapped. The film grossed only a few million dollars and barely covered the production costs of Bronson's fee. It was eventually released direct to video in multiple regions, including the United Kingdom and in Australia, and obviously on Laser Disc. So with that being said, I'd have to give Death Wish 5 two screaming guys wrapped in plastic out of five. It's barely a movie. It's weird and it's wonderful because it finally engrosses the Death Wish spirit and the series, but it's too little too late. And if I had to rank all the movies, if you care about that, here's how I do it. Four, three, one, five, two. There, it's done. It's all done. And now with all that said and done, I really want to talk about what the Death Wish films mean, or at least meant to me. It's so weird to have a legacy like this, but I think it ultimately encapsulates a period of America that went from conservatism to neoliberalism and the obvious effects of that. But in Quebec, for example, they just define it as the, the quest for identity. Yes, all forms of violence are a quest for identity. When you live out on the frontier, you have no identity, you're a nobody. Therefore, you get very tough. You have to prove that you are somebody. And so you become very violent. And so identity is always accompanied by violence. 
This uh, it seems paradoxical to you, that uh, ordinary, ordinary people uh, find the need for violence as they lose their identities. So it's only the threat to people's identity that makes them violence. Terrorists, hijackers, these are people minus identity. After all that, I can correctly conclude that the Death Wish movies had no real continuity outside of Bronson himself playing a murder machine sex god. But that's not really fair to Bronson himself. Bronson lived a very private life, and he had a lot more self-awareness and humility than his roles ever gave him. He was one of the most well-paid actors in the 1970s and 80s. In fact, when interviewed by Roger Ebert in 1974, shortly before the success of the first Death Wish film, Ebert regaled that he was a quiet family man who was just happy to take care of his family with the money he was making. To quote, he was even taking care of his three-year-old daughter upon arrival of the interview, quietly sitting at the head of the table. Ebert was initially intimidated and then handed his daughter to his wife, Jill Ireland. Ebert writes, Bronson does not volunteer information, nor does he elaborate any theories about his films. To quote Bronson, I'm only a product, like a cake of soap, to be sold as well as possible. Garfield himself even talked about the sequel, stating that he hated all four sequels and there were nothing but the vanity showcase for the limited talents of Bronson. And to some degree, I believe that. I think Bronson wasn't a talented actor, but he did fit the archetype of the American strongman that people wanted out of the 1970s and 80s. The sad thing about all of this is even after five films, no one really listened to Bronson or Garfield or to anybody who were talking realistically about the problems in the Death Wish movies. Garfield was so upset about the reaction from Death Wish 1 that he made a sequel mainly to the reaction of the first film called Death Sins. Garfield wrote the book to look at the question and the nature of vigilantism, how Americans perceive violence as a reaction to justice and how the American hero isn't a hero at all. Then, to make matters worse, in 2007, the book was adapted into a very violent film by Saw director James Wan. This was some of the trailer. I'm dismissing this case. Mr. Darley, you are released from custody. You kidding me? Your brother, dude, he's dead. I say who lives, I say who dies. So despite the book being completely different, both times, Death Wish and Death Sentence, and decrying the use of vigilantism, and the lawlessness of these types of people, the movie was more or less the same story as Death Wish. According to most critics and Brian himself, it was just another revenge thriller with a tough white guy. The plot of the movie is about a guy who takes the law into his own hands and ends up killing dozens of gang members after his son is murdered during a gas station robbery gone wrong. Death Wish, Death Sentence, it doesn't matter how you wrap this story up. Americans like violence, sure, but they don't really like the consequences of violence. We've seen that time and time again. In fact, while I was recording this video essay, the Kenosha shooting happened, and that was another horrible bit of violence that had some of the worst reactions I'd seen from not only conservative media, but just people who were meant to be in charge of the situation. It's tragic. It's horrible. But when you frame it the right way and you make it look cool and you change the perception of the people who were watching, you can only have one real message. The weird thing about Death Sentence is that Brian was actually offered to write the movie in the early 2000s, but then tasked with writing it, he pointed out that it needed to be updated and could not just be a sequel to Death Wish because there had already been four other Death Wish movies. In fact, despite being paid by all the films, Brian was unsure about who owned the rights to the original sequels at all. So with Death Sentence, it came and went in 2007, and the film was a box office bomb upon release. It only made 17 million on a $20 million budget, but it had a hell of a DVD and Blu-ray release. But then obviously in the early 2010s, video stores closed up and most people gave out on DVDs for the savior that is streaming. Garfield was disappointed yet again, but guess what? The following year, Sylvester Stallone announced he was going to make a Death Wish remake in 2009, but we'll get to that much later in a different video. The horrible thing about these movies and the modern obsession with vigilantism is that despite the concern from the media in the 70s and 80s about violence and violence in media, vigilantism remained relatively stable or barely reported on up until the early 2000s. It wasn't until we took a look at the post 9-11 side of history do we see a lot of people committing their own forms of vigilantism in different parts of society, mainly in the US. It has much more adverse outcomes than just the Bernie Getz scenario. And we're not even talking about the menagerie of African Americans who were killed by cops and people who just 
felt like they were justified in doing what they were doing. Much like Kersey, they're not pursued by law enforcement and some of them become American folk heroes because they're justified by those in power. There have been extremely rare occasions where vigilantism has rendered a neighborhood safer or people are happier about the scenario. They don't provide closure for the vigilante. They don't provide closure for the people who were in danger, either as an individual or as a group. Whether this is similar to the rise of local militias in different American towns and cities, or the Minutemen Project who independently roam the Mexican and American border, or even people who literally dress up as superheroes to fight crime. Traffic. Hey, take it too long. Huh? Who are you? I'm the guy that's trying to keep you from getting a ticket from a real cop. It's all ridiculous. It's all horrible. It all ends in bloodshed, or at least a stupid outcome that makes everybody feel uncomfortable and unhappy. Vigilantism is a system that ultimately very rarely works and is usually perpetrated by straight white males, or at least people who are already in power. Because more often than not, vigilantism exists as the ugly cousin of revenge. Specifically, revenge for something that they had felt was already owed or entitled to them. Despite the amount of in-depth work into decrying the Death Wish movies and their message, it's shown as just a desperate and depressing view of vigilantism. There are more often than not just a lot of revenge fantasy films that still paint the same picture. That's very black and white. These guys are good, these guys are bad. It's because there are very few films or pieces of media that honestly represent revenge or vigilante style violence. It's because it damages the soul, it breaks the brain. There is a lot to be said about Garfield's original vision for the Death Wish novel and the subsequent follow-up Death Sentence. It's because that Garfield, despite writing these novels and thinking about them for over 30 years, he still had a better perspective because he saw the outcomes of these movies. He saw the outcomes of his books. This is because overall the Death Wish movies are not at odds with the idea of an American hero and how it's depicted in modern American cinema or history. Especially the further you get into the series, they brace Bronson's Paul Cursing with the same bravado that you see several other action heroes. Despite the fact that there are moral grey areas here and there and difficulties with law enforcement, they still accrue the same amount of ideas and psychological profiles as your Rambos, your John McLeans, your John Matrixes. This isn't even beginning to go into the amount of toxic masculinity in these films or even in Bronson's own life which I didn't get into because look I think the man already had a hard life in general. He was a coal miner's son, he was a coal miner himself and he had felt that most of the time that people didn't like him because of his brash nature and who he was but mainly it's because you know people couldn't connect with him. He was there to be the stone cold representation of America. I was drafted into the army. It was a lucky for me. <laughs> drafted into the army, saw what the world looked like and started making decisions. And American and to a wider extent Western audiences don't like seeing vigilantism or revenge movies with consequences, even light consequences. This is at odds with films from say the East like Korea or Hong Kong. One of the greatest revenge films of all time, if not the greatest, Old Boy, has an ending so dark and so horrible that it's subversive both in its message around revenge as well as its consequences and then was a made for American audiences and absolutely desecrated. The American idealism of their heroes is that regardless of their persona, whether it's a cop or an everyman or just somebody with a gun and a reason to be a vigilante that they are heroes or to a broader definition anti-heroes they come from a similar mythology in their history they are the pioneers they are the cowboys they are the people who won the west they are the victors they get to tell history in their own words. In a New York Times article dating back to 1981, Robert Lindsay wrote about the myth of the Old West and its influence on American pop culture. Lindsay writes, largely because of fantasies about the frontier concocted by journalists and fiction writers at the time, for pulp magazines in the late 19th century, they basically present the idea of America and what it could be. Lindsay then goes on to quote historian Ray Allen Billington stating, a myth emerged that the frontier was a land of unrestrained liberty, where the individual was supreme and and law was dispensed out of a holster instead of a law book. Does that sound familiar? Bronson knew that this was his bread and butter as an actor for over three decades. Brian Garfield knew this is what he was as an author. For more than a decade, he wrote fiction about the Old West and then pivoted to crime fiction, not just because it was popular, but because he had a story to tell. In the 1996 essay around masculinity and heroism in the Hollywood blockbuster, Richard Sparks notes that the American heroes are all authority figures rebelling against authority, whether it's modern or classic. To some degree, it's what American heroism is about about believing in your own rule, that you become your own authority, and that you dictate the rules that they live by. That's what's represented here. That's what's represented in all of the Death Wish films. 
Paul Kersey is judge, jury, and executioner, and we're the people in the stands living out that fantasy. Because ultimately, Death Wish is just that. A wish. A fantasy. A dark dream that is heightened by a reality that is exacerbated by the news and by special interest groups who are looking for either sale or bloodshed. They care not about justice or an individual, but for a simple answer to a complicated question. What do you do when the police are unhelpful and you have lost everything? Or that you just feel that you've lost everything? I mean, it's quite simple. We just defund the police and then we just work with local communities to provide better help and educational services, and then we have healthcare reform and we make sure that people are taken care of. But that's beside the point. For nearly five decades, we've let a film series run as rampant as Paul Kersey on the streets of America, justifying homicide after homicide for a poorly run police force and a corrupt, horrible system that is a dangerous incentive for trigger-hungry lobbyists and the mentally ill. Death Wish is fiction, sure, I know that, and I extremely doubt that anyone who saw these films went on to kill anyone in real life except for the examples that I gave. I highly doubt that everyone who saw a Death Wish film was going to do terrible things. I just feel that these films portrayed a terrible message that people believed in. I do think the film sends an obtuse message about justice and personal responsibility. It's a funhouse mirror of ideas. That if we thought about if genders or races were reversed or just the idea that somebody else other than Paul Kersey was killing all of these people, that several conservatives and enlightened centrists would be up in arms about it. In fact, while I was recording the audio for this video, a film called Karen was greenlit and sounds basically like a modern death wish with a gender flip. Because these movies are probably going to be made after 2020. People love revenge films. People love to have their little personal grievances, whether it's cutting up a convertible or just someone you really want to stalk because of the color of their skin. So with all of that, I think that's what the Death Wish film series is as a whole, at least this 20 year period. They're poorly made and poorly executed ideals of a middle class white fantasy that sadly persists to this day in the hearts of cowards and anti-intellectuals. They were made by maniacs with several crass ideas on what the public wanted and what they wanted to see. It starred men that honestly had seen better days and were doing the work for a paycheck and that's about it. I know there's a few people who are fans of Death Wish in general and may have watched these movies and uh, look if you appreciate them and you got this far I really appreciate you just having a secondary idea on a film series that has largely been praised by a lot of people on YouTube to be honest. The films are brash and gory and ridiculous and especially from three onwards they don't really have a place in cinematic history outside of the exploitation cinema. At least, not for me personally. I didn't grow up with these films or idolizing these people, so I don't have a strong connection to them. I know that my dad and my grandfather were fans of Bronson and I had friends who were fans of these films, but they just didn't resonate with me and that's okay. There's dumb bullshit that I grew up with that I love to death that really don't have a place in history as well, like Stay Tuned with John Ritter or Joe's Apartment that I thought for a long time were comedic high art, the likes of which would never be reached and the meta commentary that it would provide, but I know now with time and with a little bit of humility that you just have to step back and breathe and ask yourself, ultimately, what am I getting out of these films? Is it catharsis? Is it an identity? Is it just making me double down on things that I already believe? Do you want to be Paul Kersey? Do you want to do these things? Or do you want to be someone who helps your community? Do you want to be somebody who is better than Paul Kersey? Because do these movies allay your fears or do they let your worst nightmares run wild? Cinema is powerful. And as Marshall McLuhan once famously said, the medium is the message. And I think Death Wish did a lot of damage to a lot of people. The stars, the filmmakers, the MPAA, the BBFC, and to some degree, America's idea of what a hero looked like to them. Because at the end of the day, you had an author who had his work twisted into a story he didn't agree with, a director who no one wanted to work with by the end of his career because of truly how awful he was as a human being, and an actor who was only ever doing it for the paycheck to support his family. I do think that these films are a little bit racist and quite misogynistic, but I don't think that they don't deserve to exist. I just think that they're make-believe. I think that maybe there's four too many of them. My wish is ultimately that people maybe have a bit more of an open mind and have a look at the message that these films are trying to portray. I want them to look into how these films were made and how the cast were treated and maybe hope the directors in the future are not as horrible as Michael Winner. The only positive note that I can say is that in the end, Bronson seemed to live a pretty good life. He was marred by the tragedy of his wife and his son passing in the early 1990s and the man once said about his life, I don't have friends, I have thousands of acquaintances. I figured out I have a wife and child. And that's what Bronson did. 
Bronson ended his life, you know, happy. Or at least I hope happy. Bronson was always a family man and that's the way that he acted. He acted as a character to support them. Ultimately, while the message of the Death Wish films are rotten, the core idea of wanting to protect one's family and loved ones is something most of us can relate to. Hell, it's written into a lot of screenwriting bibles as a way to get people to care about your characters. And that's what Bronson was always trying to do, even if it was in the absolute worst way possible. And that's what the Death Wish films are. It's America trying to care for itself in the worst way possible. You guys want to see that mannequin blow up again? What the fuck? <laughs> Alright, thank you so much for watching this video. I, uh, I had a lot of fun filming all these extra bits. I'm sorry, it's obviously three months a little too late, but I'm extremely happy with how it turned out. I know it was just as long as the Cats video, if not longer. I do feel horrible about having to go through these films and then to subject you all to all the different pieces of it. If you want to support me, do support me on patreon.com slash helpharrison. I'm already working on two new video essays, hopefully that are much shorter than this and will be out by the end of the year. I want to thank you so much. I, I recently moved into a new place, which is obviously why this took a long time to get out there. I do hope you are staying safe. I know things are still horrible right now in both Australia and in the US and in the UK and just all around of the world in general except for maybe New Zealand. New Zealand seems to be doing pretty well. Anyway, I'm Harrison Engstrom. Thank you so much for watching my video about Death Wish and the Death Wish films. Have a wonderful day and if you got all this way to the end of the video, put Paul Kersey as a coward into the comments or just message me the same thing. I would really appreciate that. Don't forget to share the video out. Do like and subscribe. All that cool stuff in the doobly-doo and uh, I just I hope you enjoy my next video which will be about one film, Death Wish 2018.